Right. Folks are jumping in. I just give another minute or two for I see people filing in. Welcome everyone. We'll get started in a minute. Just let uh, let everybody get in the room before we get started. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, happy Tuesday. My name is Jim Frankel. I am the founder and director of Music First. And uh, I am very, very pleased this evening to welcome Bob Morrison, who I'm sure you all know uh, from Quadrant Research in Artshead, New Jersey. Um, Bob uh, has done a couple of these ESSER presentations. Um, and I thought, hey, let's get Bob to speak to our Music First customers. Uh, so without any further ado, actually, one last thing. If you have questions, it's going to run about 30, 35 minutes or so. If you do have questions, we do have a QA and a um, section as well as the chat window. If you want to type them in, uh, Bob will take questions at the end. So with that, Bob, take it away. Appreciate you being with us tonight. Great. Thank you, Jim. And it's great to be with uh, you. Thanks for the invitation. And, and it's great to be with all of you this evening as well to uh, talk about uh, this thing called the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. And what does it mean? What are the opportunities for music education? Uh, so we're going to be covering a lot of ground and a lot of technical uh, information and, uh, you know, resources and links and all sorts of other things. And so I don't want you to get bogged down trying to, you know, capture names of things that I'm referencing or other stuff in, in your notes. I want you to sit back, relax, and just listen as the information unfolds, maybe take some notes along the way. Uh, but if you want, the best thing you could do is write down this URL, um, because I've created a Google Drive that has all of the resources, all the links, everything that we're going to talk about tonight and more will be in this drive uh, for you to use. So that's something that you can then dig through as we as we go throughout the session. Um, I find it just makes it easier for all of you uh, if I have everything consolidated in, in one place. And we'll talk about some of those uh, resources as we move through the presentation today. So the first thing we wanna talk about is, well, what is this thing called COVID relief? What is all, all of this about? Well. COVID relief has basically been a total of $5.3 trillion, $5.3 trillion that has been used uh, to address all of the issues related to COVID-19 uh, pandemic. That equals more than $43,000 per household. And no, you're not getting a check for $43,000, but that's the amount of money per person that the government is injecting into um, supporting uh, uh, programs uh, necessary to stabilize all aspects of, um, of our economy, of our education system, of our business community. Uh, for context, World War II cost the federal government $4 trillion in, and it was uh, in, in 2020 dollars, but that was spread over four years. And now we're talking about $5.3 trillion in 2020 dollars being injected currently. Uh, economists now are predicting that our economy will go, grow at about 6% uh, pace with creating about 3 million new jobs. And that's gonna be equal to the best growth since the 1980s. And with the additional stimulus, um, forecasts indicate that the economy at the end of the year will be marginally higher than was expected at pre-pandemic levels. So basically seeing that we would uh, recoup any losses and then be growing beyond uh, where we were at the pre-pandemic level. And it's very popular. Uh, the morning consult found that the majority of Republicans think that uh, either this is the right size or too small. Uh, there's a lot of support. And 63% of lower income Republicans support the bill. I just point that out because it wasn't really a bipartisan passage, but it has bipartisan support in, in, in across the nation. Um, so I think that's something to understand. And it's got a 
percent approval rating, including for 46 percent by Republicans. So unusually popular uh, package uh, in in this particular program. Now, as it relates to education, this is what we're looking at. So that we have the CARES Act, which was signed into law in March of 2020. That was the initial bill that came in, into being right as the pandemic was really uh, moving the country into lockdown. And then there was the COVID relief package that was signed into law uh, in 20, uh, December 2020. And then we have the American Rescue Plan, which was just passed by the Senate and signed by President Biden in March of 2020, 2021. And what you'll notice is these have gotten increasingly larger from pot to pot to pot. And what we're looking at here is total in education uh, relief uh, in, in, in excess of nearly $300 billion, $300 billion with a B dollars uh, going to education uh, support. Uh, and the way that this works out, um, just for uh, educational stabilization, $168 billion for educational stabilization, including 126 for K-12 education agencies, there's 2.7 billion in emergency assistance for non-public school programs. So if you're in a non-public school, there's money for you. Um, and there are funds that the governors can distribute. And then there's $40 billion, $40 billion for higher education as well. Uh, but this uh, elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund, what this ESSER fund that we'll be referring to, uh, the amount is allocated to each state or district based on the relative amount of Title I funding that a district receives. Uh, and states are required to subgrant not less than 90% of their funding to districts. So a big chunk of the money goes to the state, and then 90% of that, those funds the state is sending down to the district. Um, states may al make allocation to local education agencies in an expedited and timely manner. That means they have to move the money quickly, no later than 60 days after the, the funding actually hits the State Department of Education, which is why SR2 funds uh, have actually been flowing to school districts because they, they were hitting um, uh, the state agencies uh, in March. So that, that accelerated the, those funds going into districts. And we expect the ESSER three funding to begin um, hitting uh, state uh, or being available to local districts uh, in middle of June. And then a state shall receive or shall return any funds that they don't use. And I'm sure you realize that many states are not in the business of giving money back once they receive it. So um, other things to keep in mind is that a local education agency receiving the funds under uh, ESSER has to make a publicly available on their website their plans no later than 30 days after receiving their allocation of funds and, uh, and, and as part of their plan for safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services. Now you're going to hear local education agency or LEA a couple times in this conversation. That just means a local school district. So when you hear local education agency, that is a school district. Now the funds must be spent uh, by 2023. They actually have to be committed by 2023, spent by September 2024. The local education agencies must use at least 20% of the funds in ESSER 3 to address learning loss through evidence-based intervention that responds to students' academic, social, and emotional needs. So this 20% actually can be utilized to support SEL programs, and particularly SEL programs uh, where you've been able to embed SEL into your own uh, musical uh, programs and activities. Um, states are required to set aside funds for the following purposes. Five, this is the 10% that the state itself retains. So 5% five, 5 or half of the money goes to learning loss. 10% goes to evidence-based after-school programs. 1% uh, for evidence-based summer enrichment program. Um, so those are funds that are available um, that the state can make available for those purposes. And, and we'll talk about strategies for summer camps and, and enrichment and learning loss in a second. And additionally, there's 800 million uh, dedicated to 
identification and provision of wraparound services for homeless populations. So that's uh, you know kind of some of the rough overview of the, the jargon behind the bill. But let me break it down to you in some real language here. So uh, in ESSER 1, $11 billion went to school districts and 10% uh, and or about you know, 1.3 billion went to sta state education agencies in their discretionary fund. In ESSER 2, which was the December uh, pot, $48.6 uh, billion went to districts and $5.4 billion went to state agencies. In ESSER 3, $109 billion is going to um, the districts and $12 billion is going to state agencies. So this current round, ESSER 3, is the biggest of all of them and arguably the most important. For a total uh, bottom line of 170 billion just for the ESSER funds. This is just for this emergency relief fund and 18 billion, almost 19 billion going to state education agencies for di discretionary. Now what's important to understand about this is we are talking about 15 times the spending for public education that occurs on an annual basis. If, if the government was gonna do this over a normal spending period, it would take 15 years for them to spend the, the money that they are injecting into the public education system right now. So it's really important to understand that we are talking about not once in a generation, this is once in a century uh, type of opportunity and spending that's made available to support our programs. So I wanna show you an example from the state of New Jersey. So here is the state of New Jersey's breakdown of the funding. It's CARES 1, ESSER 2, and the American Recovery Plan, which is ESSER 3, and then the total. And you'll see that for the state of New Jersey, they're getting $4.3 billion to support um, the local education agency's efforts uh, around learning recovery, reopening of schools, and other strategies to address the needs of students. And if you go to the New Jersey website and in your state, I'm going to show you how to find your information. They'll give you a printout with a breakdown of what, is, what the funding is by school districts. So you can see exactly what the allocation is going to your district, which is going to be important as part of some strategies that we talk about uh, uh, when, we, when we get uh, moving into this a little bit more. But what's really important to understand, and you hear that me talk about the fact that this is formula-based following Title I, that it's based on Title I funding. It's not governed by Title I regulations. Title I regulations don't apply here. So if somebody says, oh, we can't use that because that's not covered under Title I, yeah, that's not how this is to be used. It's formula-based on Title I. It's not governed by Title I. So that brings up the question, how might ESSER funds be used? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna walk through the 15 um, guidelines that were established for the use of these funds and how they apply to school districts. And then we're gonna talk about how that connects to the work that you do in your classroom along the way. So you ready? Okay, here we go. So. ESSER governing regulations for allowable use of funds. Number one, any activity authorized by the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, including the Native Hawaiian Education Act, the Alaska Native Education Equity Support and Assistance Act, the Individuals uh, with Disabilities Act, the Adult Education and Family Literacy Act, the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act of 2006, or a title Subtitle B of Title VII of the McKinney-Vento Homeless Act, 42 USC 11431. Got it? So what all that means is anything covered by federal regulations governing education spending in the United States. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act, better known now as the Every Student Succeeds Act. So if it's authorized within the Every Student Succeeds Act, it's covered here. And arts education and music education is explicitly listed as part of a well-rounded education within the Every Student Succeeds Act. Therefore, issues regarding support for music education would fall under the allowable uses, use of funds right here, just with this particular guideline. 
Number two, coordination and preparedness and response efforts of local education agencies with state, local, tribal, territorial, public health departments, and other relevant agencies to improve coordinated response among such entities as to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. So this is basically, these, these funds can be used to help coordinate amongst other agencies, state and local government agencies, as part of their response to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. Uh, providing principals and other school leaders with the resources necessary to address the needs of their individual schools. Pretty broad, right? Very wide open. Principals and other school leaders with the, the resources necessary to address the needs of their individual schools. What are your individual needs for your school? You can use the funds to support that. Activities to address the unique needs of low-income students, uh, children with disability, English language learners, racial and ethnic ethnic minorities, students experience homelessness, and foster care youth, including how outreach and service delivery will meet the needs of each population. Again, addressing educational needs uh, of some our, of our special populations. Uh, developing and implementing procedures and system to improve the preparedness and response efforts of local education agencies. Money that's used on how you respond uh, to uh, the coronavirus. And one of the reasons why some of these are in here, and it's important to understand, is that the funds can be used for any activity starting in March 13th of 2020. So funding that was used earlier in the, in the pandemic um, are allowable uses of funds and you can be used, the district can be, can be reimbursed for the expenditure of those funds. Training and professional development for staff and local education agency on sanitation, minimizing the spread of infectious disease. Again, what are the strategies that they need to put in place? What are the tools that they need to have to minimize the spread of infectious disease and training for our personnel? Uh, supplies to sanitize and clean facilities of local education agencies, including building operating by such agencies, which includes your music room. What do you need to keep your room sanitized, to keep it clean, um, whether it's puppy pads for uh, your wind instruments or uh, the wipes to, to wipe down countertops and, and cleaning of mouthpieces. All of those things fall under number seven. Number eight is planning for coordinating and implementing activities during the long-term closures, including providing meals for eligible students, providing technology for online learning to all students, Sound familiar? Uh, provide guidance for carrying out requirements under IDEA and ensuring other educational services can continue to be provided consistent with all federal, state, and local requirements. Again, so technology, things that you needed to, to do to prepare for this long-term closure, uh, all allowable, allowable uses of funds. Nine, purchasing educational technology for students who are served by the local education agency. Stop right there. So any of your tech technology needs, hardware, software, connectivity, programs that you have purchased, these things can are allowable uses of funds, can be used to backdate purchases, but can also be used for purchase future purchases. So if you're like, hey, we, we made these purchases last year and we want to continue them, you can go to your administration and say, hey, we would like to continue to use these technology resources, and there's money available in ESSER to support our use of those funds. Providing mental health services and supports, this covers social emotional learning needs of students, and we'll talk about that in a second. Planning and implementing activities related to summer learning and supplemental after-school programs, including providing classroom instruction or online learning during summer months, okay? This is the summer camp language. So if you wanted to have a summer camp because you wanted to jumpstart your program because you hadn't had your students together and you wanna bring them all together for a summer camp so they can start playing together or introduce them to new instruments to give them a jump start on the new year, you can do that with these funds. Or you can go to your administration and say, hey, can we add a music component to the summer learning institute that you're putting in to address learning loss or to address accelerated learning? That's an allowable use of funds. So it's time to be creative and think about how you can fit into some of these boxes as allowable use of funds. Addressing learning loss among students. 
including all the special learning categories that we talked about. Addressing learning loss among students. And guess what? Learning loss has occurred in your music programs. We know that. We've lost students. Not only has learning been lost, students have been lost. So how might we use this to recap our, recapture some students? How might the funds be used to help move our students further along um, in catching up or making more progress? Um, and this includes how they're using assessments, implementing evidence-based activities, providing information for parents and, serve, and, and uh, families on how they can support their students, uh, and tracking student attention, attendance and improving student engagement, right? All things that we can cover through our work in music education. Um, 13, school facility repairs and improvements to enable operation of schools to reduce the risk of virus transmission and exposure to environmental health hazards and support student health needs. So this includes work in your, in your, in your music rooms, uh, repairs and other improvements for the safe operation of your music room, reducing risk of virus transmission. Uh, and that can be any of the PPE materials that you use, masks and other things. Uh, inspecting and testing and maintenance, repair, replacement, upgrade projects to improve the indoor air quality of school facilities, including mechanical and non-mechanical heating, ventilation, air con conditioning systems, filtration, purification, and other air cleaning fans, controls, and window and door repair and replacement. So this is all about HVAC. This is all about ventilation. Um, and I know a lot of schools are using the funds in this way, but if you happen to be in a, in a space where there's not great ventilation in your room, but you really need to use the room and you're not getting the air turns that you need, they can use this funds to put in an air purifier into your room that would make up for the, the lack of uh, institutional ventilation in your room. So again, creative ways that these funds could be used, but this is the ventilation one. And then my favorite of all favorites is number 15, uh, because you know, whenever you're, you, like you get a job description at the end of the job description, the last line always says, and any item as assigned by the supervisor, right? Well, that's number 15. Number 15 are other activities that are necessary to maintain the operation and continuity of services in the local education agency and continuing to employ existing staff of the local education agency. So anything that wasn't covered above, but is necessary to maintain the operation of the school can be an allowable use of funds. And that includes support for your programs. So I've taken you on this wonderful journey through the 15 guidelines, because now it's time to talk about how does that apply to your program? How do we use these funds for music education? And these are just some idea starters, and there's going to be more materials in the Google Drive that I set aside for you uh, that provide you with idea starters along the way as well. So you can use them for instrument supplies and materials to help ensure health and safety. And here are the, the, the guideline numbers that this applies to, 3, 5, and 13, right? So you can go in and go, hey, I can use this to buy instruments for uh, our, our students because they can't share instruments anymore or we need new instruments that have broken down along the way. And that's covered under 3, 5, and 13 of the federal guidelines. PPE and cleaning supplies for sanitation, 3, 5, and 7. Facility considerations, like we talked about, ventilation, uh, reconfiguring of rooms, um, covered by 13, 14, and my favorite catch-all, number 15. Uh, instructional support and additional faculty covered by four, nine, 10, mental health, social, emotional learning, and 11. Uh, and so instructional support to the degree that you are providing your programs in a way that addresses the social, emotional learning needs of students, um, that falls under number 10. Summer programs covered under 10, 11, and 12, like I talked about, uh, surging uh, these summer camps with the uh, beginning opportunities for students or returning opportunities for other students, but ways to engage them, ways to reconnect them, ways to get them to do the thing that they've missed the most. And that's playing together, playing with others. You can create those opportunities. That gives you a jump start on the new year. And this, these funds can be used to pay for these camps so the students can come for free. And that's the idea of giving students opportunities that do not cost them anything um, but certainly will uh, be supported by the use of these funds. 
planning, and number one, two, uh, five, and eight. Planning for the new school year. What are the things that you need to do? How are you going to do things a little bit differently? What have you learned along the way that you want to keep and continue and integrate into how you will be teaching in the future? That's all part of planning, and these funds can be used to support that. And then others. I mean, these are just idea starters, you know, to get you thinking creatively about what is it that you could use in your program um, that would be a long-term investment. And it's important to understand that because when I talk about long-term investment, I mean, these funds do not go on endlessly, right? They will sunset um, and you'll get, you'll spend the pot of money and then it's gone. So you want to make sure that you don't set yourself up for failure by investing in things that are going to need ongoing long-term support that the district is not in a position uh, to maintain. So people talk about, well, I'd like to use this, these funds to hire more faculty. That's great. You can do that as long as you have a strategy on the other side. And I do know of districts that are using this to hire additional middle school teachers so that they can run multiple years of beginning students to make up for the fact that they know that they lost you know, a number of beginners along the way over this past year. But they're also planning and recognizing that that's not a permanent solution. Uh, but they know that going in and they're prepared for what happens on the back end when these funds no longer can support those positions. Now, there's guidance that are available for the use of funds in the Google Drive. NAFME just came out with their toolkit, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, Arts Ed New Jersey, we put out our guidance for our arts educators. And again, you'll see that we list behind each of the idea and ideas and way more than we talked about this evening, how these funds can be utilized uh, and the appropriate guidelines that they attach to. Again, use this to analyze your own program. But what this does is it creates an opportunity for us to think differently, to reimagine what it is that we're doing as we come out of the pandemic. And I think that's important for us to understand. And I wanted to highlight again, the SEL component of the guidance from the federal government. Um, because I think these are important opportunities because we know how much our students have missed. We know how much our students have missed playing together. And we know the important role that music plays in their lives. That's addressing their social emotional learning needs. And we need to make sure that our administrators understand that as our students come back into school, that these programs, our music programs, our arts programs are going to be their safe place. It's going to be their place where they find a sense of belonging, because our students aren't going to be able to learn other things until they feel safe, until they feel a sense of belonging, until they feel heard. And for many students, that place is our music rooms. So it's also important to understand that districts are have to solicit public comment on their use of funds before they determine how they're going to use the funds. There has to be meaningful public engagement in the process. And additionally, the plans for how they're going to use the funds when they're finally determined ultimately have to be posted on the website. Uh, and this is a quote from uh, the, 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 uh, the guidance itself, where it says, meaningful collaboration between districts, educators, unions, and other stakeholders. Meaningful collaboration. That has to take place in order for this to work. So what do I do now? Okay, so you've, you've thrown all this stuff at me, you know, they've got a Google Drive full of information, but what do I do? So here are some things that you can do now to engage in the process. First of all, become knowledgeable about the ESSER funds and practices for ensuring safe in-person learning in instrumental and vocal programs and refer to the resources provided. And there's a lot of links to information on ESSER in the drive. Um, and additionally, get familiar with your state's guidance, and we'll have a link in there for that. Once you understand, okay, what are the funds available in your state and how much money are you getting for your district, go to your supervisor and ask for support for some willingness to create a plan to allow for a safer return to school for students participating in your music programs. Oftentimes, we've heard from several educators who they've taken this information to their principal and it's the first time their principal has heard about it. And then the principal is ecstatic that they know about it. And then all of a sudden they're engaging with the music teacher as a partner 
um, in, in this process. So by you getting your information, by you getting your facts, positions you as knowledgeable about this. And it also makes sure that they can't pull the wool over your eyes by saying, no, you can't use that for music programs. It's only for reopening of schools. It's only for learning loss. No, that's not true. And you know it's not true because we're providing you the information to support that. Follow uh, the model, solicit input to address post-pandemic needs. That means if you have parents that wanna see the funds used to support um, expansion of music opportunities for students, they can provide that feedback to the administration. Um, but you wanna work with your administrators and supervisors, your colleagues, your band boosters and support groups, parents, community partners, you know, all folks that can be uh, involved in the process, including your student leaders. Give students some voice and choice in this process as well. Now, uh, here are some success stories. So you don't think that I'm just making this stuff up and it's just like, this is all theoretical and no one's really gonna give us money for this. Well, it's not theoretical. Here are some real things that are happening from programs around the country based on some of the prior funding. So in Grand Pass High School, Oregon, they spent $375,000 to purchase new instruments for the high school and two middle school band programs, $375,000. That's a lot of new instruments. Dayton Public Schools, they're funding a two week after school percussion camp, including two out of district percussion consultants and one drum line for, and, and one for steel band, right? So they are creative use of funds in that way. In Pinellas County, County, Florida, they use the funds for PPE materials and equipment. And another Florida school district spent $300,000 for music curriculum, for a new music curriculum, because they hadn't bought one in years. And this was the opportunity to invest in a new music curriculum. And as I mentioned, in New Jersey, in a district here in New Jersey, they're paying for two uh, middle school instrumental teachers to surge uh, beginning instruction across multiple grades, letting anyone in the middle school who wants to begin a musical instrument the opportunity to do that. And then in, in Nebraska, support for a summer instructional program around instrumental music. So these are just some of the ideas, some of the success stories that are out there, but it's an opportunity for you to be strategic. It's time to plan, right? Use the planning time right now. How, if, if, if my principal walked in and said, I have money, how would I spend it? What would I wanna do? So develop a plan now and then take it forward. Um, think about where you can take your programs based on what you've learned over this past year. Where do you wanna go? This isn't just about returning back to what we were. This is about how do we move forward? How do we position ourselves for growth in our programs? Because I personally believe that we are on the precipice of some significant growth in music and arts education programs uh, as we come out of this pandemic. And look to the opportunity to learn standards that NAFME has out there on about things that you can use uh, for facilities, to upgrade facilities. Again, appropriate use of funds. Uh, that guideline, those guidelines can create opportunities and information for you as well. And you know, be grateful. You know, this is a difficult time for everyone, particularly your principals. So offer to help lighten the load. Uh, volunteer to do a drum circle for the first faculty meeting. Think of ways to connect with summer learning opportunities. Students will come to other, other academic offerings if music and the arts are involved in the summer learning opportunities. Create a welcome back boulevard with percussion students to provide an ex exciting first day atmosphere as students come back. Offer to participate in a welcome back assembly. Keep your administration informed. Share good news about what you're doing with your program. They always value when someone's bringing them good news and good information. And smile a lot, because just a smile can make the difference. So if you go in with an idea and a smile, uh, more likely to be listened to than if you approach it another way. And say thank you. They say thank you for things that they've already given you, the support that they've already provided. Um, because I think oftentimes people don't say thank you enough. I'm a sitting school board member and I'm blown away anytime somebody shows up to say thank you for what we've done as school board members because it's few and far between. So administrators hearing them, someone say thank you, really, really important. So here's your call to action. Look up and review the, this information as it relates to your specific district 
I'm going to show you the website and how you can find that information uh, for you. Take the information to your supervisor or your school administration to share. Let them know that you know. Develop a plan for how these funds can be used to support your program and create more music learning opportunities for more students. I talk about the fact that this year is not about the most perfectly balanced ensemble or you know, creating you know, the most ideal situation in anything. Let them all in. Everybody can play. Anyone, you're, you're in a high school and you got a 10th grader that wants to learn a mu musical instrument, teach them, let them in, open up all the doors and windows. This is not a time for us to be exclusionary. This is a time for us to embrace everyone, to allow them to experience music and to use music as part of the healing process as they come back into school as, as you know, after being out of schools during this pandemic. And then look at fundable activities. Nash, NAFME is doing a whole social media campaign this month. Uh, where every day they're putting out another idea and suggestions on how these funds can be utilized to support your programs. And lastly, if you don't, you're not going to get anything if you don't ask. So if you don't ask, you don't get. They're not coming to you to tell you that you've got this money. You need to go to them with a plan. So if you don't ask, you don't get. So don't, if you, and if you don't ask, don't complain that nobody told me. So the website that you can go to is the National Conference of State Legislatures. Again, all this information and lots more is are, are going to be in your uh, in the Google Drive that I've set up for you. Uh, but a link to this website is there. And here, uh, the specific link will take you to a page where you can Google in your state. And it will then come and, and show you the amount of money that's going to your state in each of the, the pockets. Um, it will point you to the SEA or to the guidance uh, that has come out. Usually each uh, state Department of Education has an ESSER page with all of the information, including probably either an Excel spreadsheet or a PDF with the dollar amount for your district. And so what you want to look for is look for ESSER 3 and look for the funding for your district under ESSER 3. And remember, everything that I talked about is right here in this Google Drive. So go to this Google Drive uh, and you'll be able to access all of the information. I'll make sure that I drop it into the chat here uh, once I stop sharing and we do some Q&A. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and I'm going to turn it back over to Jim so that he can guide us through our question and answer period. Great. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Bob, for decoding ESSER. I think for a lot of us music educators, we've heard the word, um, but we don't quite know what it means for us. And it was really wonderful to get like a step-by-step, -step, uh, this is how you do it. Um, so you'll see we put the links in there as well as the ncsl.org uh, to get it. Now, if, are there any questions? If you do, you can type them in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, Bob has agreed to stick around for a little bit to... Uh, to answer any questions that you might have. So I'll give you a few moments to ask them. So there's a question, once you have a plan and it's approved by your principal, do they know what to do to get the money? That's a great question. So everything goes to the district. So the, the district themselves um, just have to, you know, apply to the state department. There, and it's not really a, this formalized grant or a competitive grant. There's a pot of money allocated for your school district your district just has to go, this is how we plan to use the funds. So if your principal in coordination with your superintendent gets the green light, you know that information goes up to the person who deals with the state and puts in the grant information, and then the, flood, the, the money flows back to the district. So um, it's not a complicated process, but you do have to get involved in the conversation. Bob, the next question, can you show us how to find the state allocated funds on the ncsl.org website? They are on the site and they're not sure where to go exactly. Sure. So if we go to the Google Drive um, that I set up, and when I'll, when I'll, let, me, let me try to do this here. Uh, let's see. Just bear with me one second. I have to open up an application. Yeah, no worries. Um, so what I'm going to do is. I'm going to go, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share Safari. 
And we're going to go to Google Drive, right? Ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. And you, know, you see, I've got a lot of drives in here, but this is, this is the music first drive. So here's all the information, the aerosol study, ESSER funding and fact sheets from the federal government, the guidance that I talked about for music and arts education in here, you'll see our guidance from New Jersey, NAFME's guidance, as well as uh, links. So if you go through these, if you go to the state information, here you'll see um, the uh, state and local government uh, coronavirus re relief fund. Uh, you click on that, oopsie, uh, and that will that will download for you the information that's there. Uh, and then the um, elementary and secondary relief tracker uh, that will allow you to go to um, this site here, which is the elementary and secondary relief tracker. And then if you just scroll down to the bottom, you'll see the uh, area where you can type in the name of the state. So you can type in uh, New Jersey, and it gives me the information for New Jersey, including the link back to my State Department of Education. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the URL here, uh, and I'll just drop it into the chat. So if you want to, oh, if you want to find it that way, you can go directly there. But it is in the Google Drive, uh, along with the other information. Great. Um, two more questions for you, Bob. Maybe, maybe, maybe three. Um, sure. Somebody who is has been hired. They think they are. Kimberly um, says, "I think I'm one of those summer people they've hired to make people uh, come to their summer camp, but they haven't told me what they want me to do. I think they just want me to come up with suggestions. So, uh, any suggestions for Kimberly on what what she can do in a summer camp?" So I would actually coordinate with back with the district to see what is it that their needs are going to be, right? So I, I would talk, you know, maybe talk to the music educators or a music supervisor there, say, hey, what what would be most beneficial? Do you create, you know, a, a beginning music class, or do you create some sort of general music class, or do you create a music technology opportunity? It really is going to be driven by what are the resources that they have available to you? And what are the needs of the district? I, I do know that a lot of places are, are bringing in people uh, really to try to jumpstart um, performance opportunities for kids because they haven't been able to play together. Uh, in many instances, I know some of you watching are in, in, dis in districts and parts of the country where you've been together for a while, but in the vast majority of places they haven't been. So that would be my suggestion for that. Great. Thanks, Bob. Two more. Um, I work at an independent school. Understanding that the bulk of this fund is intended for public schools, would my school still be eligible? Yes, there is a dedicated pot of money that's available to each state for private schools. Um, so that those funds are now it's not near as much as what's funneling into the, the, the public school environment, but there are funds that are available for your private school, your independent school. Um, so talk with your uh, administration there. And there's also a link uh, that I put in the federal guidance uh, bucket where you can, um, uh, that will take you to the information specifically for uh, non-public independent schools. Great. Of course, now the, the questions are coming, flowing keep, in. Keep um, them coming. Keep them right, coming. Great. Thanks very much for your time, Bob. One is, uh, it, it's not first come, first serve the funding. The districts are absolutely allocated this money. They don't have to fight for it, correct? No, nope. there's there is there they have their own allocation based on formula, uh, and based on that formula, that money is sitting there for them. Now it's up to them to then go to the state to say, Mr. State, here's how we plan to use the funding, and then Mr. State goes, okay, here's your money. You know, they have to be able to track and account that it was appropriate use of funds, which is why we went through those appropriate use of funds guidelines for you. But as long as they do that, it's a very simplified proce process and an accelerated process. It was the intention of the federal government to push these funds down to the districts swiftly. Um, and so that's what we're seeing as it relates to that. So nothing fancy. Um, but, but again, like I said to you, you don't get if you don't ask. And the same thing is true for the district. If they don't ask the state and say, here's how we're going to use it, they don't get. And the money ends up actually being returned to the federal government. Right. So, uh, Jack Leo, your question, I believe, was just answered by Bob. So the last one that I'll take is from Jeff, Jeff Lipscomb. 
And the way I understand it, funding requests go through the state government. What if I'm in a state that refuses to act or decides to limit it as far as music goes? So um, I am not aware of any state that has uh, uh, tried to limit the funds. Now, uh, there have been a couple of states that tried to get cute uh, and not use the funds um, uh, in a way to support, you know, enhancing programs. Basically, what they did is they took CARES 1 and CARES 2 and said, thank you, federal government, for that money. We won't spend our own money and we'll just still fund public education the way we normally do. So the net, there was net zero, you know, benefit for the school districts. So the, the feds got smart this time around and said, no, you have to ma provide what they call maintenance of effort. And what that means is they have to spend themselves on average what they have been spending and must continue to spend that over the next several years so that the funds that come from ESSER 3 actually move from the state to the LEAs as intended. So there is that. Um, and I don't believe because the way the, the language is written that a state can say, oh no, you can't use it that way. Um, you know, the, the federal guidance is pretty clear. Now the states can say, we want you to emphasize learning loss. We want you to emphasize school reopening. We want you to emphasize summer camp, but they can't say, but you're not allowed to use it for music programs. Got it. Um, Nicholas says that there's an error when he tries clicking on the New Jersey Department of Ed guidance. So maybe uh, that, have a look at that in your uh, Google Drive and we'll correct it if we can. Nick, appreciate that. Nicholas, appreciate that. So anyway, um, to wrap up, and first of all, uh, again, Bob, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for sharing your knowledge and expertise on this subject. It's something I certainly learned a lot uh, this evening and uh, it should be very exciting to people. We all need things to cling on to right now for hope uh, for the year ahead. And I, I'm certainly feeling a whole lot more optimistic uh, about uh, music programs in the schools next year. If you like what you saw tonight, um, please uh, check out musicedtechconference.com. On Tuesday, July 20th, we'll be doing a free six hour professional development event. I've invited Bob to participate in that and, and do a kind of a follow up session. Uh, so if you missed uh, this one, uh, please attend that. Uh, again, musicedtechconference.com. And uh, if you'd like, you can go to musicfirst.com and sign up for a free 30-day trial for any of our software. I have to put that commercial in there. Sorry, Bob. Anyway, thank you very much to everyone who attended. We appreciate it. And uh, and, and have a great rest of your school year. And Bob, thanks again. We, we really appreciate it. Take care, yes, everyone. Good night. Good night.